All right, so NoSQL Injection WAF Evasion Fundamentals. So we're going to be going over a lot of items today, but although we are going to be looking at WAF Evasion through a NoSQL kind of injection context, these items can be easily extrapolated uh, into just basic WAF Evasion techniques that attackers leverage in general. So pretty excited uh, to share this with you. So as a quick talk scope, so you can kind of have some expectations, as always, we're going to be doing a bunch of exercises. This includes thought exercises as well as actual exercises uh, against a your live you know a live environment uh, that you're going to have through a Docker container. So okay, so the first exercise really going to be evaluating WAF attack vectors by looking at mod looking at a mod security WAF rule. Uh, we'll kind of go into what mod security is and whatnot uh, within a couple slides. But uh, yeah, we're going to be looking at some uh, a WAF rule and different payloads that are going to be evaluated uh, or that that WAF rule will be protecting against and looking at how to kind of potentially get around them. Also, another exercise is really, and this is the crux, deducing backend logic through a, a URL structure to bypass potential WAF rules and dump all documents within a MongoDB collection. And this is an extension of the No uh, SQL Injection series, so um, there should be should be an L here, but <laughs> but anyhow. Um, so um, if you have not looked, especially uh, this is basically a, a core extension of the last tutorial. Uh, I believe that was episode. 15 or 16, I think we're, on, we're about to be on 17, so um, episode 16. Uh, but anyhow, uh, if I was wrong on that, just go to uh, the, the NoSQL Injection Series link right here and just click on whatever the number was before. That is like a core prerequisite to uh, this, uh, this tutorial. Uh, so yeah, just as a little heads up. Okay, so let's do a really concise uh, WAF web application firewall review. So a firewall is a network security system that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic based on a predetermined uh, based on predetermined security rules. So the security rules item right here is really what we're going to be hyper focusing on. Now, what is an example of a WAF? Well, that is Mod Security, and Mod Security is an open source WAF engine uh, for that basically can plug into Apache, IIS, or Nginx, uh, and uh, you can check it more out at this link here. But um, Mod Security, as well as all other WAFs, uh, leverage a rule set, and what we're going to be looking at specifically in this uh, tutorial is really a, a WAF rule within the OWASP Mod Security core rule set, and this just generic rule set is really rules that can be loaded into Mod Security. Now the CRS, as they see in their GitHub page basically aims to protect web applications from a wide range of attacks, including the OWASP top 10, which makes sense, this is from OWASP, <laughs> um, with a minimum of, of false alerts, okay? So just as a little heads up. So here's the thing. Um, now, we're, we're, we'll be kind of leveraging, looking at this uh, within uh, this, this next kind of uh, idea, with this next exercise in the context of a rule, but let's just do uh, some, some basic review beforehand. So um, if you have not uh, checked out the, the blinds, uh, once again, the, the NoSQL Injection Blind uh, Injection Fundamentals course, uh, just you can definitely click on this link and check it out. But um, what we saw in that tutorial was this uh, right here, okay? Okay, um, this URL, and we basically we leveraged a logical operator to force an always true condition. So that logical operator is right here. You see the or between one and true, and that forced an always true condition that dumped all of the um, all the documents within uh, the, a given MongoDB collection. Now, but here's the thing. Okay, now we're kind of getting back to the WAF. Now, logical operators are often blocked by WAFs, okay, such as OR and AND, these logical operators. And let's see an example of that within the OWASP uh, mod security uh, rule. Uh, there's actually a rule in particular to SQL injection. And this rule will block these payloads. And you can actually check out uh, a little bit more about this at this link. But you see that, you know, these are kind of common payloads that uh, are leveraged in, in SQL injection. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
here's the thing, and now here's really the thought exercise, is given the above rule, okay, that blocks all these items, how should an attacker try to fetch or dump all documents within a MongoDB collection? So if they can't leverage this, this URL right here, okay, what else could they potentially put there uh, instead of a logical operator? Now, and I asked this question really from a super high level. Uh, so just kind of just think about it and uh, you can pause the video and then I will continue. All right, I'm continuing now. So here is the answer. Now, okay, so they should target functionality that is just unique to a given application. In other words, no generic rule will block it. Now, I know you might be seeing that and being like, oh, well, dang, that, that just, okay, well, of course, of course it's that. <laughs> but um, once again, it's like, I remember when I was starting kind of down this path, I mean, these, these items that if you see it a certain way might sound obvious, aren't always as obvious, um, just kind of right in the beginning uh, when you're kind of building your foundation. And that's just to be expected with everyone. So, um, so yeah. So, so obviously, like the attacker now. Now that we see it this way, obviously the attacker is is trying to find something. Uh, a determined attacker is trying to find something unique within a, a given application that will get around these just generic WAF rules. Now, so here's the thing. So the, the attacker would basically want to replace this item right here with a value that is just unique to juice shop uh, in, in our example, because we are leveraging that uh, basically just to uh, just to evaluate uh, kind of our injection tax against. And this, really, you are going to be finding this unique value um, within, this is going to be the main tutorial assignment. But before we get there, we need to kind of um, do some, some, some more little exercises to kind of get us to the point, uh, which is the main assignment, which is at the end. So we'll do a couple of those right now. So first, in order to find that unique functionality, right, or that unique uh, identifier that should be going right here, okay, really the idea is you, uh, the attacker has to, has to do some deduction on some of the backend logic that's occurring, right, so they can find out what value to put in there. And this is kind of the, the question that uh, an attacker would be thinking about just kind of in their mind when they're evaluating this. So, okay, so different values of inject me, okay, so right here, create different responses. So if you want to kind of check this out, you can do, do this docker run command and then try one and try one e or, or, or true. So what I'm going to do is just right here, here's one, so one is already in here. And you see just one items just kind of returned. So if we go through, oops, my bad. Let me get out of here. Let me just go back here and I will just repaste this. And we will just go um, one or true. Okay. Obviously, now this is dumping everything. Okay. So yes, this would be blocked by a WAF. Um, but just, just know that an attacker is just going to try all kinds of different values and the, the, the core idea here is that different values of inject me uh, basically come back with different responses. So one other item if that wasn't that would not be blocked by a WAF. So we have one. So let's try three here. Okay, cool. So here's another here's another value. So what could an attacker deduce from that is well well, actually, I'm going to ask you that, <laughs> okay? So given this, what action is the backend doing with the user's input? So just kind of think about it for a sec, and then I will continue to the answer. Now, here, user input is being compared to some unknown value within the backend, okay? So that's just something that the attacker would just kind of make that, that logical assumption. Now, if, now, but here's the thing. If the attacker finds this unknown value, okay, they can force an always true condition while evading the WAF, okay? And, and once again, if they find that always true condition, they can dump all, all objects and all object properties and pro potentially see some really sensitive information, okay? Now, now, here's the thing. This is under the assumption 
that the back end is doing basically an equality comparison between user input and unknown value. Now here's the question, okay? Why is this a valid assumption? Why not say a greater than or, or something else, okay? So kind of go back and just think about that. And you know, you can uh, substitute a few more integer, integer <laughs> values into inject me and just kind of look at the response and uh, look at the number of responses, okay? And you can kind of deduce from there that it's making an equality comparison. And, uh, and yeah, so here I'm going to give the answer in just a second, but uh, you can kind of think to yourself, why is this a valid assumption? Okay, so here I'm going to go ahead and give the answer. So really it's just, hey, given the one object response, the backend logic is probably making an equality comparison. So based on that, the attacker can look for something, some user input that is directly going to be equal to that unknown value. Now, what is the, 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 the unknown value? Well, it's going to be an object, okay? Um, it's going to be object, it's going to be something else, but the, the base of it is going to be a certain type of object, an object. And here's the thing, we can actually deduce about what object that's going to be, and that's going to change how we're basic, or the attacker, uh, we're, we're putting on our, the attacker hat today, but how the attacker is really um, going to craft the payload. So in the last tutorial, we found that this injection worked, okay? And by doing this, basically an attacker could inject the sleep command into all kinds of areas of an application. And then if the response was lagged by two seconds, okay, because these are, mil it, it, the sleep function expects a millisecond value. Um, anyhow, if the response was lagged by two seconds, the attacker would then know, oh, then this particular area of the URL is vulnerable to a certain type of injection. And we, we went over this last time. Um, so if you haven't checked out that tutorial, check it out. And if, if you already have, this is a little bit of a review. So think about it. What did this tell us about where this sleep function was being evaluated? In what context was it being evaluated? Okay, so just kind of just think about it for a sec and I'll just kind of stop uh, and you can pause the video. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and give the answer right now. Okay, so okay, so here is that base URL and inject me or this part right here is being evaluated within a JavaScript expression that is passed into where. Okay, and, and how do we know that? Okay, well, here's the thing. So if sleep worked right here, okay, that means that there, um, that this is vulnerable, this is being evaluated within a, um, basically a JavaScript expression that's passed to where, because sleep is a whitelisted function that is specific to where execution context, okay? So the, the, the attacker could, could make this, this, uh, this deduction. Now, here's the item. So the attacker goal, okay, to, to uh, kind of to rephrase is to find unknown value so they can force an always true condition. And we saw why they, they can make the, the deduction that this is an equality comparison on the back end. So they're just trying to find this, uh, this unknown value, okay? Now, here's the thing and here's the question. Given the where context, what object is this unknown value? Okay. Now, if you saw the last tutorial, you'll you'll know um, the, the name of this object. Okay. And if you if you already know the name, go through the MongoDB docs or just other places on the internet, and it, that object can also be known as another name as well. Okay. Um, so just it's kind of a good exercise. So even if you already know the one value that was spoken up upon in the last tutorial, see if you can find the other the other kind of synonym uh, for that name. And if you haven't, uh, yeah, check out the docs on where and see um, what kind of what what's the object name that's being evaluated uh, usually uh, within that execution context. So you can pause the video. Um, and if not, I'm just going to kind of continue on with the answer in a couple of seconds. OK, so here's the answer. So it's either this or or OBJ for object. And as a brief recap, where iterates all over all documents within within a MongoDB collection. 
okay? And the current document is assigned to this. So you could think about it as if actually I will give it within this context. So if you think about the collection is users, then the current document would be a unique uh, user, okay? And the, the logic within the back end could do this dot address um, to basically say get the address of a given user. So anyhow, off of the, the this object, properties uh, of the document can then be re referenced, right? Such as this dot address. Okay, so the back end could be doing something like this. So here's the question. Let's go through and just try this right off of the bat within that one uh, place that we were injecting. So when we do that, we don't see any data coming back, okay? So what is that? So what's the next step, okay? So a determined attacker would not end there, okay? So if this doesn't work, we can make a further deduction that the backend logic is probably leveraging a property within this, such as something like this, <laughs> there's so many thises, <laughs> um, in the comparison, right? So it's not just leveraging um, the, the, the object, it's leveraging a, uh, it's not just leveraging, yeah, it's not just leveraging an object, it's, it's basically referencing some property within the object, okay? So and that kind of brings us to finding that unknown value, that unknown property value, okay? What is the name of it? Uh, is essentially what we're asking there. Uh, so uh, not the value, but what is the name of this property? There we go. <laughs> so, okay. So, all right, so back to our core URL right here. Now, here's the thing. Given the backend logic is probably comparing inject me to this dot unknown property, okay? Now, leverage the URL to deduce the database schema and find that unknown property. What is the name of it? So, and I think this is a really good exercise because it shows how parts of just an application, right? Um, or just the URL scheme, or not the scheme, but just the URL structure and the naming conventions in it actually show a lot of information about uh, a database schema and how just the, just the app, some of the internals work. So, so anyhow, try that and see if you can dump all objects or all documents within the MongoDB collection. And uh, you can pause the video, then I am going to go ahead and continue in a couple of seconds. Okay, so here's the answer. Really, so we have our, we, there's, there's the URL again. Now, this dot product. So um, this could dump all the sensitive information. So uh, I know right here it's just like kind of product reviews, but um, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of expand upon why this could be very sensitive. So we pop this in and we see all the information, okay? So, and this kind of makes sense that there is a product property because the item that we're injecting comes right after it. So if this was one, Right, um, so it kind of makes sense that there is this uh, equality happening with this product property. Okay, now here's the thing. Okay, now if this look might look super just like oh, uh, within this context it doesn't look too harmful, but check this out. Imagine that this is some GUID or something or some just really long unique identifier that is only that sh really should only be known to you or your account and the back end pre presents your UI or the user's UI with it because they are authenticated okay now if you could dump all documents within that given collection you could potentially see other items that are mapped to other users and other unique identifiers that you can then leverage to access um, information about other users okay or basically assume their role um, within the application so and you'll see this all the time and i kind of brought this up in the last uh, episode that you'll see these super long unique identifiers in a lot of applications right and that's basically it's trying to um uh, tie uh, it's 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 doing that because there's usually some sort of sensitive information there that uh that, so they make this random number that and they give it to you so anyhow uh just kind of a, a little item there now 
here's the thing. Here's the actual backend code. So it's doing a where and it's doing this dot product and it's and it's basically making an, an equality comparison to ID, which is directly mapped to inject me. Okay. So that's how that's working. Now let's do some some takeaways on this. So in general, you cannot rely on WAFs for complete protection, okay? So attackers will find unique identifiers within your application to bypass these generic WAF rules, as we saw with this dot product, okay? Now it'd be very difficult for a WAF to, 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 to uh, detect. How does it know that this is, um, you know, because I mean, WAFs are trying to do this, have this balancing kind of uh, game between blocking items and also they don't want to block, you know, traffic that is actually legit, right? Because um, I mean, ultimately the, the, the core item of the business is to have customers leverage their ap application, right? Because uh, without that, um, business fails. So all the security in the world doesn't matter. So, so WAFs are, are the, the rules are, are trying to make it uh, so there is an there is not all of these false positives, all right? And you can actually see that within mod security, they have what are what are called different paranoia levels. So as you as the paranoia level increases, the um, the false positives could potentially increase, but also the security of the WAF and what it blocks increases as well. Um, so you as a user or as a as an administrator of a site can actually kind of pick this trade off as well. But anyhow, it's a little bit of a, a side tangent, but I think it's important. But um, but also just know, I mean, this would be a hard item for a WAF just to just to 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 you know um, to block. Now, when developing an application, here's the key: think about what information you are exposing through public information. Now, an attacker views everything as an information source, such as the URL structure. We were able to basically kind of deduce um, the database schema from that, okay? And that was really uh, good information when doing that injection intact that we just saw. Also think about version numbers, okay? A lot of people don't think that this is a vulnerability, but attackers will leverage that, um, which is usually known within a lot of uh, applications. They usually leak this information in certain ways because the uh, people who created it um, don't really lock it down. Uh, and that version information can easily be correlated to different um, basically vulnerabilities. And then the attacker knows how to, what a vulnerabilities to, to leverage versus a certain, say, Node.js server, et cetera. Now, here's another interesting one. Think about job postings. Now, when you go on LinkedIn or some other job or, you know, places where people post jobs and they basically give their whole technology stack there. Uh, and, and so an attacker from that could really deduce kind of what are the internals through that. Um, and we're not kind of getting, this is not a, a reconnaissance um, tutorial in general, but I just wanted to just to kind of highlight the fact of a URL structure can kind of give a lot of, um, you know, internal kind of information, uh, but there's also others as well. And just to just to really, I hope you take away that every single little part, even the URL structure to everything else, um, is a piece of information that attackers can leverage against you. So, um, so here's the thing: it's always a trade-off between um, changing some of these items and and usability uh, for developers uh, within an application, right? So it's like if you obscure which security through obscurity um, isn't really a, a proper security mechanism. But let's just say you kind of go through and you obscure that, that whole URL structure to make it so it doesn't map to your database schema. But now it's like the trade-off there, right, is that some uh, other developers or some other pieces of your application might not be able to easily map items as well. So there's ways around it, but I'm just telling you um, kind of when you think about items that your your application leaks, okay, and you think about trying to hide that, okay, well, then the trade-off is it in an operational complexity under the hood, okay, that you might be creating for developers. Now, I don't know what that trade-off is for you and your application, but just know that's just kind of the trade-off that exists there. So, yes, and everything can be um, leveraged against you. Oh, excuse me. So that's that, that little bell. Is That means it's my time to go. So anyways, um, I hope this was uh, informative to you and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Thanks.